used for seeing us in that time of, of singing and worship. You know, they practiced for several weeks uh, on Wednesday nights getting ready for this. And I'm just thankful that we have a group of youth that want to, to lead in worship. Right? They want to worship God. Um, and as, as that, uh, that, that's what we are here for, right? We're here to worship. And, and we recognize we all worship in different ways and, and different methods, but the, the idea behind it is the heart. And it's a heart of worship. And so I'm thankful for the youth and their, their willingness to, to lead us today. Um, as we uh, get ready to go to God's Word together, I want to open us up just a word of prayer just so that we can focus our hearts and our minds on God. And prepare to hear from Him. We believe that God speaks through His Word. Um, and that He uh, has a word for us today. And so we want to, to hear from Him. We want to, to just allow Him to um, come into our lives. And speak to us wherever we may find ourselves today. And so I, I want to pray for us. I also want to pray, uh, as I normally do for another church here in town today. Uh, I want to pray for Grace Christian Church. Some of you all may have heard uh, their youth pastor uh, passed away unexpectedly this week. His name's Josh Hall. And so they're going to be having a memorial service later on today. So I just know a lot of people in that church and in this community who have heavy hearts this morning, uh, mourning the loss of, of this young man who's in his 30s. Um, and so let's pray for that congregation today and pray that um, as difficult as this may be, that God that may be glorified in, in, in this time. So let's pray together. God, we just thank you this morning as the youth have, have led us in singing, have led us to, to look to you uh, through uh, music. God, to lead us to, to, to sing words that reflect that we trust you. God, that you are mighty to save, that you are mighty to act into our lives today. Um, Lord, we, we believe those things, and so we sing those things out of hearts that believe them. And so I, pray, I just praise you and thank you for a group of youth, middle schoolers and high schoolers who want to sing those things. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to impress on them uh, just that, that desire in their life. Lord, this morning we are burdened and our hearts are, are heavy for our brothers and sisters at Grace Christian. Uh, Lord, as they have lost their youth pastor this week, uh, in an unexpected situation. And God, we just pray for them that you would bring the joy of your salvation into their life as they go through this, this loss. Remind them of the peace that, that comes in knowing you even in times of loss and in times of hurt. God, we, may we minister to them any way we can as their brothers and sisters in Christ. They may be a different congregation, but we serve the same sovereign God. And so may we come alongside them and encourage them, support them in this time. Lord, we love you. We want to hear from you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it was the year 386. And there was a, a young man named Augustine who found himself in a garden. And he was just despondent. He was broken and hurting. You see, his mom had become a Christian. And he had left the faith that she had always wanted for him. And so he, he started this long journey of searching. And so he, he tried several different religions. And he came to the point where he just realized that it was all futility. Right? He, he just couldn't find what he was looking for. And so in this moment in this garden, Augustine heard this voice, this child's voice. And it kept saying, take and read. Take and read. And so at that moment, Augustine knew what he had to do. And he picked up his Bible, and he turned it to Romans 13. And, and this was a man who had heard from the, the church father, Ambrose, who Jesus was. And he knew in his head who Jesus was, but he couldn't completely give himself over to this Jesus. He was holding back. Because he, he loved his sin too much. He didn't want to give that up. And so he's, he was running from God. And yet he, he heard this child's voice. And so he opened to Romans 13, verses 13 through 14. And it says this. He read these words. Let us walk with decency as in the daylight. 
not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual <laughs> impurity or promiscuity, not in quarreling or, and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. And in that, in that instant, when, when Augustine read those words, God removed the doubt in his life. God removed the, the things that he had been running from, and he gave the confidence to give his life to Christ. And so Augustine followed Jesus at that moment, and he was now delivered from a life of just chasing after sin and running from God. And he went on to become, what many regard, as the greatest theologian in the church since the Apostle Paul. And many of us know who he is today. Some of us have read some of his, his books. The Confessions of St. Augustine is a well-known book today, even, even you know, 15, almost 2,000 years later. And so this was a man who was radically, in an instance, transformed by God's Word from, from running from God to running to God. And, and the same... Yeah, and what Augustine realized was he had to come face to face with the reality of himself before he could, he could follow God. He had to come face to face with the, the reality of his own struggles before he could be changed. And the same is true for us today. And maybe today there, there's something in your life that you know is not right, but you're running from it. And we see this in the life of Jacob. We've been looking at the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Jacob is one of the founders of our faith. He was one of the founders of the nation of Israel. And he's one of the founders of the Christian faith. And we've already seen how God has been with Jacob through all these ups and downs in life. And in spite of all these ways that Jacob has failed, God has been with him. And God has actually blessed him. Because of God's good and, and faithful promises. And so we've seen how God has taken uh, the wealth of his uncle Laban, who became his father-in-law, and, and given that to Jacob. In spite of uh, Jacob's unfaithfulness. We've seen how God has made Jacob's family grow. He now has 11 sons and a, and a daughter. And, and in spite of uh, two very broken marriages. And, and so we see just how God has blessed him. And, and Jacob knows this, and yet... We also see today that Jacob hasn't fully learned to trust God yet. He's not there yet. He's still got some growing to do. And how do we know that? Well, if you would, turn with me to Genesis 31. We're going to read uh, starting in verses 1. In verse 1 of Genesis 31, you can follow along with me on the screen, or if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And we're going to see this word from God. Now Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that was our father's and has built this wealth from what belonged to our father. So these, these sons are angry at him, right? This was their inheritance. It's, it's now Jacob's. And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude toward him was not the same. Then the Lord said to him, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Jacob had Rachel and Leah called to the field where his flocks were. And he said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude toward me is not the same, but God, but the God of my father has been with me. Okay, so, so God's telling Jacob to go. He has left the land of his fathers and, and come to this land to find wives, or a wife, and, and to build a family. And now God's saying, look, now it's time to go back. And Jacob jumps at the opportunity. He's ready to go. And he acknowledges, look, God has been with me all through this. And yet, we, we keep reading and we see that uh, something's not quite right. So let's turn to, to verse 17 of Genesis 31. It says, Then Jacob got up and put his children and his wives on the camels. He took all the livestock and possessions he had acquired in Padan Aram, and he drove his herds to go to the land of his father Isaac in Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel, that's one of Jacob's wives, stole her father's household idols. And Jacob deceived Laban the Arab, not telling him that he was fleeing. And he fled with all his possessions, crossed the Euphrates, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. So, so imagine if you had your family living with you for 20 years, and you have uh, your children and your grandchildren... And then all of a sudden, one day, they just up and leave. They don't tell you they're leaving. They're gone. That would hurt, right? That, 
That, that would, if you're a grandparent or a parent, that would be hard. And yet we see here that what we see is Jacob is running, right? He's running from his father-in-law, and he doesn't know he's leaving. He just gets up and gets out of there as quickly as he can, right? And so this is what is going on. Something's not right here. So kids, we have our kids, elementary kids, in worship with us today. If there is something in your life that you've done good, right? If you've done something good, if you've, maybe you've helped out with a chore around the house that your parents had asked you to, or maybe you did, they didn't even ask you, you just did it. If you've done something good, do you run from your parents after you do that chore? No. I see some of you shaking your head. No, you don't, right? Because you think you've done something good. You think you're going to get a reward or get a pat on the back or something. Well, well, in this story, we see Jacob running away from his father-in-law and running away from his uncle. So what does that tell you? It tells you maybe he didn't do something good or something's not right with that relationship, right? And, and so what I want us to, to see here, as we think about this idea of running and how he's running from his family, God wants us to know today that we don't have to run. We don't have to run from him. Whatever it is that you're running from in your life, God is big enough for it. And we can trust him in those things. All right? And so, so I want us to, to think about this story and think about the things that we can learn about who God is and how we can bring that into our life to keep us from running. And so the first thing I want us to recognize is, is to see that we run when we are afraid of something. All right? We run when we are afraid of something. So Laban here sees that Jacob is gone, and, and he brings his, his other sons and his other relatives to go chase after Jacob, to go find him. All right? they're, they're obviously understandably frustrated and angry with Jacob for just leaving. And so he catches up to Jacob, and he asks him, look, why did you leave? And so look at verse 26 in, in Genesis 31. It says, Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You have deceived me and taken my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you secretly flee from me, deceive me, and not tell me? I would have sent you away with joy and singing, with tambourines and lyres. He would have sent him away with a party, right? But you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters. You have acted foolishly. I could do you great harm. But last night the God of your father said to me, watch yourself. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. All right, so we see that, that um, Laban is, is obviously upset, right? He's angry. And then Jacob answers him in verse 31. So, Jacob, so Laban's asked him, look, why did you leave? And Jacob says in verse 31, Jacob answered, I was afraid of you, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. So why did Jacob run? He was afraid. He was afraid of his uncle. He was afraid of his father-in-law. And he ran. He ran from him. And so really, this came down to a faith issue. right? Because if, as we just read, God had told Jacob to leave. He told him it was time to go. Now Jacob had a choice. How was he going to leave? Was he going to leave the right way and say his goodbyes? And let his father-in-law kiss his, his daughters goodbye and his grandchildren? Or was he just going to get up and run? And what did he do? He ran. That shows that he, he didn't really trust God to, in, in that situation to, to let him leave the right way. It showed a lack of faith on Jacob's part. He thought he still had to take it into his own hands and make sure that he was safe because he wasn't sure what his father-in-law would do. And then we also see in the story that his wife, Rachel, was also running. Look at verse 19. It says that uh, before they left, when, when Laban was out in the field to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household idols. Now, in, in that culture, um, the, the households had these idols that they, they worshipped, that they thought would bring them good fortune. A lot of them were ancestor-related idols. And so if you've seen the movie Gladiator Kids, I don't recommend you all seeing that yet. But if you've seen that movie, they have household idols. And, and they pass them on from generation to generation. And it's supposed to bring good luck to their family. And so Rachel steals these things from her father. So now she's running from him too. Right? And, and so when he, he catches up with them, when her father catches up with Jacob and his wife, he's looking for those idols too. And in verse 35, he comes to Rachel, and she's sitting down 
covering up her idols, and she comes up with an excuse that she can't get up, so, so she doesn't have to, so he can't find those idols. And so she's running from him because she's scared. She's afraid of what he's going to do. Um, a, a few weeks ago, in our, in our kids' classes and in our adults' classes in Sunday school, uh, we talked about Jonah. Do you all remember learning about Jonah in the kids' classes? And, and let me ask you this, kids. Did, did Jonah, at the beginning of the story, did he obey God or did he run from God? Do you remember? He ran from God, right? God wanted him to go to this city and tell these people, look, you need to change, you need to turn to God. And instead, Jonah went the other way. Why? It's because he was afraid. He was afraid that his enemies wouldn't get the punishment and, and the justice that they, he thought they deserved. Instead, God would let them get off the hook and, and, and actually be saved by him. And so Jonah let fear cause him to run. Just like Jacob, just like Rachel, they're afraid of Laban. They're running. And sometimes, I want us to see, and I want us to, to think about this, sometimes it's the same with us. Right? Sometimes we are afraid of something, and we run. We get out of there as quick as we can, and we don't look back. Now, sometimes this can be a good thing. Right? If there's something that could physically harm us or kids, if there's a, a stranger or a bully, it's good to run. Right? It's good to, to get away from those people. So it can be a good thing, but a lot of times we run because we are afraid of something that we know we deserve, right? Um, in our house, you know, if the kids in our house, uh, we have three kids, and if they do something, we always tell them, look, it's better just to be honest and fess up from the beginning if you've done something, right? Don't run. That's, that's only going to make things worse, right? Just be honest with us. Criminals. Criminals run all the time, don't they? Just last year, the, the government arrested 33,000 federal fugitives. These are criminals that have run. Their, their first instinct is to run so they don't get caught. Because they, they're afraid of what might... They may, they're afraid they may have to go to prison. Or they, they're afraid that they may face something worse than prison. And, and so when we have disagreements with people, we often run from those people, right? Instead of actually get talking with them, you know, like normal civil human beings. Instead of talking with people, we run from them. We just try to avoid them completely. And, and there may be a, a time for that, just to calm down or cool down or whatever, but eventually we, we, can't realize, we realize we can't run forever from those people. We need to have some of those hard conversations. Sometimes we run from obeying God. Like if we know that God's calling us to, to talk with this person. <coughs> But we, we're afraid of how the conversation may go or mentioning the name of Jesus in the conversation. We run from those, those conversations, right? Or maybe he's calling us to, to move overseas as a missionary, and so we run from God because we don't want to move overseas. We don't want to leave our family, right? We're afraid of, of being alone. But then, then I think one, one thing that we struggle with a lot, even as Christians, is running from a sin issue in our life. There's something in our life that we know is separating us from God. <clears throat> could be a prideful thought. Could be a, a lustful temptation. It could be unforgiveness. There's some type of sin in our life, and we run from God because we don't want to deal with that. We're afraid of, of living with that reality, uh, that something may not be right with us. So we run from it. And we often run, get this, we often run from God because we're afraid if we get too close to him, we may see something about ourselves we don't like. All right, we run from God because we, we may have to take a hard look at ourselves. And so we, what do we do? We, we skip anything related to church. Right? We, we avoid worship. We avoid small group. We avoid Bible study because we don't want to think about God and how far short we fall. Right? We're, we're afraid of that. We're um, afraid of what we, we might find. We don't hang out with... Christians, because those people may actually challenge us to change and deal with something in our life. Instead, we hang out with people that we think we are better than, right? Oh, I'm better than that person. I don't do this. And so I, that makes me feel pretty good about myself, so I don't have to worry about the thing I'm struggling with in my life. Or maybe we just start filling our lives with other things so we don't have to think about the hard realities of our life. So we, we turn on our phones. It's I've been there, right? It's easy to just get turn on your phone and turn off your brain, right? Just scroll down, scroll down. 
or to or we turn on the TV or we turn on computer games if we're kids or whatever. Because we don't want to sit and think about how's my life right now? How's my relationship with God? And deal with those things that aren't right. And let's be honest, we all have something in our life that isn't quite right. But the question is, are we running from those things? Or are we dealing with them how God wants us to deal with them? And I want us to see a lot of times this, this running is motivated by fear. Fear that we have to change, that we have to do something different with our life. We can't stay where we are. We get comfortable staying where we are. Do we want to change? Are we afraid of changing? So is there something in your life right now that you are running from? Maybe you've wronged someone. Maybe there's a, a temptation in your life. Maybe you just feel like your life is far from God, but you're not really, you're not really trying to find God. You're just running from Him. Our inclina- that's our inclination as humans, right? To, to run, to turn and run. But God has a different desire for us. God, point two, God wants us to face our fears. He doesn't want us to run. He wants us to face our fears. So Jacob tried to run away, and what happened? Laban came after him. Do you think that was an accident? And we believe God is over all things, Right? And so it was not an accident that Laban came running after him because God was intervening in this. If you see how God appeared to, to Laban in, in the dream, look, on the third day Laban was told that Jacob had fled, so he took his relatives, pursued Jacob, and then verse 24, God came to Laban, the airman, in a dream at night. Watch yourself, God warned him. Don't say anything to Jacob, good or bad. That is a God who is intervening, who is in control, who wants them to meet. But he wants them to meet the right way. All right? He wants them to, to address each other, come face to face with each other. And so God is already at work in this. <coughs> and then we see when, when Laban catches up, there's some tension. You, you can understand that, right? Have you ever had a, a time where you come face to face with somebody and, and maybe something's happened and you all finally meet and it's just awkward, right? It's awkward, or maybe there's anger involved. Sometimes we may say something we don't really want to say, or we t- wish we could take back. That's where they're at at this point. And so Jacob and Laban meet, and there's this tension, and Jacob just clears the air, right? He just lays it all out there. He, he, he tells him in verses 36 through 42, Look, I've worked 20 years for you. You have changed my wages 10 times. Basically, you've cheated me 10 times. You've made my life difficult. You've you've done all these things, and yet God has been with me. And so it's all out there now, right? This is why Jacob ran. Laban, you want to know why I left? This is it. How are you going to respond? And yet, Laban didn't come back at him. Right? A lot of times that's what we do. If somebody's angry with us and they're, they're coming at us, what do we do? We go back at them. They say, well, you did this, you did this, you did this. But that's not what happens. Right? Laban responds by saying, let's make peace. And so he initiates this covenant. In, in the Bible, a covenant is a lasting, binding agreement. God makes covenants with us as his people that last forever. He will not go back on his word. That's what a covenant is. That, God, that, that they're going to have a lasting peace that they won't harm each other in the future. And Laban is the one who, who wants this. And this wouldn't have happened if Jacob had just run away and Laban hadn't caught up with him. And there would have been no peace. There would have just been this, this awkward um, relationship that would have lasted forever. And this anger and this bitterness. But God had a better plan. And God was big enough to bring about a, a lasting peace in this situation where they were running. And he wanted the, the, the matter settled. But to do so... I want us to realize this. To do so, to get peace in this relationship, to, to, keep, or to stop Jacob from running, Jacob had to come to the point of facing his fears. He had to come to the point of, of being honest with why he was running and why he was afraid. And God literally pursued him to settle it. God literally came after him. Kids uh, here in this room, have you ever done anything 
knowing that you're going to get in trouble, and you run. Right? Maybe it's your parents. You know, oh, I have done something I shouldn't have done to my parents. I'm going to run. So I don't get caught. <clears throat> but the problem with that is, after you run, you're sitting there waiting, you're sitting there waiting, you know you can't stay gone forever. Right? And eventually you're going to have to face that parent or that teacher or whoever you're running from. And it's better just to be honest from the start. This is, you know, if Jacob had been running his whole life, can you imagine living 40 years running from your father-in-law and, and just that, that weighing on you? It weighs on you, doesn't it? You feel more guilty when you run because it's unsettled. God doesn't want us to run. He wants us to, to settle those things in our life that, that make us uncertain, that cause us to run, that, that cause us just to, to, to feel a sense of guilt. God wants that in us. He wants us to, to quit running in fear and, and to come to the reality of who we are. And to, to come face to face with those things and to deal with them, to let God work. Because that's, that's the truth, right? When we come face to face, then God can work. When, when Jacob came face to face with Laban, God could work in that relationship. As long as he, he was running, he couldn't. But what we'll find, like Jacob, is that we serve the same God. And that God is powerful enough to bring about a healing, to bring about a peace where we've been running. God can do those things. Do you believe that in your life? Do you believe God can do that? In the depths of your heart, do you believe that God can, can take whatever it is that you're running from and bring healing to it? We have a, a Bible that testifies to a God who can. <coughs> we have our lives, the Holy Spirit in us, that testifies to a God who can. Believe that. And this is what it means to live the Christian life. The Christian life is not just meant to be a one-time decision where we, we say we're going to follow God and then we go to heaven. No, it's meant to be a life convinced by the power of God to bring healing in those things we want to run from. We believe God is alive in us now. And so this, this brings us to some hard situations in our life, doesn't it? There may be something hard in our past that we've been running from for years. And what we need is to, to forgive that person or to receive forgiveness. And yet we keep running and it's weighing you down. We need to come face to face with the reality of those things and let God work. Maybe you've been running from a sin in your life. Look, if we follow Christ, if you've made the decision to make Christ your Lord, you don't need to run from sin. You need to let God deal with that in your life because He has already forgiven you. And the power of His forgiveness and His grace is the power that allows you to conquer that sin. The power that He rose from the grave in is the power that He gives you to conquer sin in your life. Don't run from it. Just deal with it. Let him deal with it. Maybe you can't forgive yourself for something you've done. The Bible tells us there, when you are in Christ, there is now no guilt. Right? Romans tells us there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> so if you can't forgive yourself, realize that, that God has gone to the extreme lengths of sending his son to the cross to die for you to forgive you. You can forgive yourself. Right? Because if we can't forgive ourselves, we can't move forward. We can't live for him because this guilt is just weighing us down. You don't have to run from people because of what they think about you because your identity is not what people think but what God thinks about you and how Christ gives you a new identity. Right? You are brothers and sisters. You are children of the king. So you don't have to run from people. You don't have to quit coming to church or quit being around Christians because of what you think people... Like, think, what, we are all sinners, right? None of us have any reason to think badly about anybody else. We need to look at ourselves, right? And, and so, that, that as Christians, we realize that. We are reminded of the depths of our own sin, but the surpassing grace of God's mercy and how he's sufficient for those things. And that, that's why we speak that hope to each other, because we need it. And so... I want us to realize we have nothing to hide. We have nothing to run from that God cannot heal in our lives. 
We, we need to stop running. We need to find forgiveness in those things. We need to find hope. We need to find the peace that he brings. And until we stop running, and until we acknowledge ourselves and who God is, we're not going to find that. But at the moment we, like Jacob, come face to face with, with whatever it is in our life, and we decide to, to, to give it to God, that's what Jacob did. He made a covenant in God's name. He gave it to God. When we do that, God brings what we're longing for. His grace can conquer anything that we struggle with. He is sufficient. And so this event in, in Jacob's life is really meant, as we look at the big picture of the Bible, the book of Genesis really sets the stage for who God is. Right? It sets the stage is showing that, that God is creator, that God is ruler, that God is faithful, that he is powerful. So we see here that continuing with Jacob's life, God is powerful. He is ruling over this situation. Will we let God rule over our lives? That, that's what it really comes down to. Or are we going to run? God will provide a way. So are you running today? Are you running from others? Trying to hide? Are you running from God? Some sin in your area? In, in some area of your life? Know that you will never experience God and the power that He offers to you if you run from Him. Come to that moment in your life where you stop and say, God, I can't do this anymore. I need you. And then take steps to follow Him. Right? It's not just saying it, it's believing it to where we act. Where we surround ourselves with other Christians who can Support us and encourage us. We surround ourselves with God's word who speaks truth into our life and what we need. We put ourselves in positions where we show, God, we mean this. We mean this. So let me encourage and challenge you all. Take the risk today. Because it's a risk, right? You can't do what you've been doing. Take the risk and you will find God faithful. He will meet you where you are. He's proven by sending his son to us. He wants to meet you. <coughs> While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He, he will meet you. So God has pursued you. You've been running. Stop running. Turn to him. Trust in Christ today. It starts with genuine repentance. With a genuine acknowledgement of, I'm broken. I need to turn from what I've been doing and turn to you, God. In a, a placing of our faith and our trust fully in Him. Will you do that today? Let's pray together. God, we just praise you for this encouraging word that you give us, God, that, that we don't have to run from those things in our life that we know aren't right. God, you want us, more than anything, instead of running from those things, to run to you. May we make that commitment today, God, that we will run to you in all things in our lives. And we will find lasting peace like Jacob. We will find reconciliation where there was brokenness. God, you are powerful, you are mighty to do this in our lives. We're calling on you now to do it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.